Welcome back to Anxiety Slayer. I'm Shan Vanderleek, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Jill Stoddard about her new book, Be Mighty, A Woman's Guide to Liberation from Anxiety, Worry, and Stress Using Mindfulness and Acceptance. This episode of Anxiety Slayer is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Have you been considering seeing a therapist, but you're not sure where to start? BetterHelp will assess your counseling needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist so you can start getting the support you need online in under 24 hours. Special offer for Anxiety Slayer listeners, get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. Dr. Jill Stoddard's Be Mighty leads you on a bold quest to gain a deeper understanding of your anxiety by exploring your own origin story, how your early experiences led to thoughts and behaviors that may have offered comfort and protection at one time, but are now keeping you from living your best life. After reading this fabulous book, you'll learn to respond to present day triggers in a new way making choices from a more conscious, values-driven place. Jill A. Stoddard, Ph.D., is founder and director of the Center for Stress and Anxiety Management, a multi-site outpatient clinic in San Diego, California. She specializes in acceptance and commitment therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety and related issues. She lives in San Diego with her husband, two kids, and two French bulldogs. Welcome to Anxiety Slayer, Jill. Hi, Shan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. It's a pleasure. And congratulations on the success of your latest book, Be Mighty. What a fabulous book. And I know that you reached out to us quite some time ago to, to get on, and I'm, and I'm glad you're here. It, it took us a little while, but we're here, and your book is still out there and doing so well. So many great reviews. Yes. And actually, it's great timing because the book just passed her first birthday. Yes. So this can be happy like a, a celebration of the- <laughs> <laughs> About a year ago, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Stephen Hayes. And he told me that that time that he pioneered act to help people with mental health issues feel fully, think freely, and live lives that reflect the qualities they choose. And I'd like to begin our conversation with you sharing with us how ACT can support women who often struggle with anxiety, health anxiety, and anxiety attacks. Yeah. Well, ACT is a little different from some of the traditional ways we go about attacking anxiety in that the main goal of ACT is about developing psychological flexibility. And so this is really tuning in to the life you want and the person you want to be and showing up and doing what matters no matter what. So we often get caught in a trap where we do this waiting until thing, you know, like, oh, you know, maybe I have a huge dream. So I'll give you a personal example. I had a really big dream of doing a TEDx talk one day and an opportunity arose to be able to do that. And I was terrified. I mean, I can feel my anxiety rising right now just talking about it. <laughs> what we often do is say, well, I just, I, I just need a little more expertise and I just need a little more practice. And once I get my anxiety under control and I feel more confident and less insecure, then I'll go ahead and do this. And what ACT is all about is becoming an observer of all those thoughts and feelings that we often get really hooked by and and sort of we allow those thoughts and feelings to dictate our choices rather than letting what's important to us lead the way. The thing about doing what matters is it's going to come with anxiety because if it didn't matter, you wouldn't care. Oh, so well said. I used to do a lot of speaking and and moved away from it, moved into just other areas of interest, but oh my goodness, the number I would do on myself before speaking. And I was very good, very well prepared, knew what I was speaking about. Once you got me on stage, there was no turning me off. You couldn't shut me up, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But what I put myself through before it was something else. And over over time and over practice and everything that lightened up, but there was still that uh, my, my speaking coach would say, 
Try and take that anxiety and turn it into excitement. And on some right. days I could do that. On other days, it was just a matter of forcing myself really to just do it. Right. And, and I think, you know, this all gets a little bit confusing for human beings because sometimes when we feel panicky, you know, when we feel fear, it's because we're in danger and our body is saying you need to fight or flee if you're going to be safe. But sometimes we're having those feelings and it's, you know, it's a false alarm. It's a perception of danger when it's not really dangerous or what it is, is it's a quote unquote social danger that, you know, when you're public speaking, you care that people think you're competent mm -hmm. and interesting, that you have something of value to deliver. And if you think evolutionarily, early humans, we didn't have fangs or claws or we didn't run fast. We had each other. We're social beings. Early humans who hunted and gathered and traveled together had a survival advantage. So to constantly be checking your status in the group to make sure, you know, am I doing my part? Am I valued or am I going to get kicked out? Because if I get kicked out, I'm dead. And so we've really evolved to be creatures who compare ourselves to others. And of course, social media has made that far greater than it was ever <laughs> intended to be. But it's this very normal, natural thing we do to care what others think so that we don't risk getting booted from our tribe. And so sometimes when fear and anxiety and panic and all that arise, it's not a sign that we need to go run and hide, run to safety, run to the comfort zone. It's a sign that we really care about this thing that we're doing. And when you're laying in bed at night and you can't sleep and the wheels are spinning and it's 2 a.m., you're not worrying about whether Netflix is going to go out of business. That's not what keeps you up at night. What our wheels spin over is our family, you know, our loved ones, our jobs, the things that really matter the most to us. And so part of ACT is really recognizing that our pain, our anxiety is not the enemy. It's everything we're doing to move away from it. And that if we can learn to have a different relationship to it, that we don't treat it like the enemy, it does tend to soften. The goal isn't to control it. But what we find is that when we focus on moving toward a life that matters and we allow anxiety to be part of that, it tends to be far less powerful. Uh, so very, very true. In Be Mighty, you refer to the anxiety triumvirate. What, what is that? We know that there are three main factors that really fuel anxiety. And when you listen to these, you'll go, oh, that's why we all feel so distressed, why we've all felt so distressed these past 10 or 11 months. And it is when we have a difficulty tolerating uncertainty, when we have a low perception of control, and when we have an overinflated sense of responsibility, that those things together really tend to fuel anxiety. And what's interesting is the amount of control you actually have doesn't really matter. So if you have a lot of control, but you perceive that you do not, you will still be anxious or the opposite is true. If you don't have any control, but you think you do, then you won't be quite as anxious. And when you combine those three, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> to really to be yeah. like, okay, I have no idea what's going to happen next in, in the situation we're in now with with COVID, with uh, everything that's been happening in in our country politically, with all of that's happening with race, etc. You, you look at this and go, okay, good lord, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't. That's right. I, I what can I control as far as you know, I always laugh when I say, what can I control? Because I am a recovering control freak. So uh, <laughs> I realize that there's not a whole lot I can control that, that I even really need to, other than to be kind to myself and my family and, and the people in my uh, circle and, and the people that I work with and to, to do what I know is best from my frame of influence. And then of course, the overinflated sense of responsibility. When I read that, I was just, all I could do is crack up because that is something I, that we've never really talked about much is, oh, wait a minute, how important are we really in right. this grand scheme of things? But big picture thinking, sometimes we uh, are trying to take on the world. Yeah. It's just all that's going to do is cause more pain. 
Well, that's exactly right. And and what we end up doing, what we're sort of driven to do is if we're feeling overwhelmed by uncertainty, we try to get more certainty. Mm -hmm. And if we feel like we don't have control, we try to get more control. If it's possible to do those things without any cost, there's nothing wrong with that. But what often happens, I'll give you an example that that I think everyone listening will probably be able to relate to. We've all done this a time or two. Think about when you've had some sort of vague medical symptom. Maybe you've been feeling really tired and it's not usual for you. And there's the, I don't know what this is. I can't fix it. So there's the certainty control. The responsibility may play in with, you know, I've got to get this under control because I've got kids to take care of or a job to do. And what do we do? We go to WebMD or, you know, some we, we Google something. And now what went from we're just tired because of decision fatigue over the past 10 months where everything feels exhausting to now we're convinced we have leukemia or congestive heart failure, but we still don't know. So the right. uncertainty is actually higher, the control is lower, and the anxiety is greater. But we do it because it works in the moment. Like in that moment, you give yourself permission to raise those fingers over the keyboard. You do have a sense that you're doing something. You're getting to the bottom of it, bottom of it you're taking control. But in reality, it makes everything worse. It sure does. We often recommend that our listeners do not go to WebMD. Yeah. <laughs> Please do not visit WebMD. If you're concerned, reach out to your doctor, make an appointment and go in and have a conversation with a person instead of creating all these narratives that can just make you feel worse. Right. And the same thing happens with social media. I think especially right now, and I personally have been more guilty of this in the last couple of weeks than usual, is the doom scrolling. When everything feels so uncertain and out of control, there's this function to getting on Twitter or whatever your favorite platform is. Well, maybe this will give me all the information that I need. But again, you still don't really have, there's still uncertainty. There's definitely still no control. And now there's greater anxiety. And so really recognizing the function of these behaviors, like we do it because it gets us something in the moment. Otherwise we wouldn't, right? Like procrastination, right. we all know it's not great for us, but we do it because in the moment we put something off, we get relief. There are a lot of things we do in response to anxiety that have a short-term benefit, some type of relief, but a long-term cost. And to be able to get really sensitive to what am I doing and is it working? to move me in the direction that I want to move in, in terms of my values and who I want to be and what I want to stand for? Or are these really just efforts to get into the comfort zone that might actually be blowing up in my face in the long term? When you talk about doom scrolling, just the amount of time we're spending in front of screens anyway, and the yeah. information that's coming at us that may or may not be true I found myself very much in that uh, loop of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram news, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram news, just like going mm -hmm. around and I had to bust myself and say, okay, wait a minute. This is not, this is not helpful. This is creating more stress and more anxiety for me right now. And so what I did is I found a couple of sources that I trust completely that have been vetted, that I trust that when I want information about politics or when I want information about COVID, that's where I go and that's it, in and out, because the other was causing too much suffering. I wasn't being mindful about my behavior. I was really in that heightened sense of very much fight or flight, like what's happening? It was right at the beginning of the right. pandemic and it was, everything seemed like all too much. And then as soon as I honored myself and got away from all of that, things got so much better. And it may be a value, it may be important to you to be someone who's informed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're talking about is I want to remain informed. So what's the least amount of reputable information I can take in to be informed and then letting go of the rest, which is that chasing the dragon, trying to feel better, but it's not really working right. side of it. How can we cultivate might through mindfulness and acceptance to help us move through our anxiety? Mindfulness in the context of acceptance and commitment therapy is really just about becoming more aware so that you have the space to make values-driven choices. So what I mean by that is it's really a way to get off autopilot. For me, where I struggle the most with this is, 
you know, the end of the day, I'm feeling tired. My kids are tired. They're fighting with each other. And when they fight, it is just like nails on a chalkboard for me. I am instantaneously irritable. And my tendency, if I am on autopilot, is to just snap at them, to yell, to raise my voice. Sometimes even when they're not being naughty, like even if they're just playing, but they're being really, really loud, it's really tough for me. And so what mindfulness allows is, can I drop in and really be aware of what's happening in my body? Where does that irritability show up? My, you know, my, my shoulders are at my ears. My muscles have instantly tensed. And can I take a breath and just slow the picture down (laughs) and in that space, make a choice about the type of parent I want to be in that moment. And where the acceptance folds in there is I don't have to get rid of the irritability in order to be able to respond in a different way. Like, good luck with that, right? (laughs) I'm sure all everyone listening and you and me have all tried really hard to just magically make our feelings go away in the moment that we're having them. And that's not always a very easy thing to do. So can I be aware of my thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, make space? That's what the acceptance is. And, you know, acceptance does not mean liking or wanting. That would be crazy. That would make one a masochist, I suppose. But it's really about allowing something to be present that's already here anyway, and then choosing to engage in a way that matters, in, in a way that's in in a way that's values consistent. So even if I may not be feeling patient, I can choose to act patiently because that's the type of mom I want to be. I don't want to be a yeller. And when you can do that, when you can actually deescalate and handle it the way you want to, even by saying to your kids, hey guys, today was, wow, really, really crazy and I need a little bit of peace right now. Do you think you could take it outside? Or just something that lets them know where you're at and you understand where they're at and invite a different outcome. Yes. And I found that to be helpful with my daughter or, you know, we have a very mouthy Siamese cat and <laughs> um, and her name is Mulan and she likes you to know that she is in control, in power, and this is her home. And sometimes you just can't even imagine it, Jill. She just will not shut up. <laughs> oh, I we love were talking it. about how we want to be kind to her. She's been with us for years. She's an old lady cat now. And how much we don't want to be uh, hollering at her all the time to, to be quiet. And mm-hmm. so it, anyway, I, I realize it's kind of a little off track, but not because she's a part of our family too. And oh, absolutely. She, and she's always been very talkative. It's just sometimes it's over the top. The other thing this is making me think of is what we're talking about here is cho- the choices we're making in each moment. Mm-hmm. And the reason this example with my kids comes to my mind so readily is, like I said, it's the thing I struggle with the most. So I fail to do this the way that I would like to all the time. Right. But when we're talking about making values-driven choices, about being mindful, about practicing acceptance, in the very moment that I realize, oh, I blew it, I just screamed, I get the very next moment to choose again, yes. to go to my kids and say, oh, you guys, I'm so sorry I yelled at you. I didn't need to raise my voice. And to basically have a take two. And then I'm modeling someone who apologizes, who admits her mistakes and takes responsibility. This business of being a human being is really hard work. And trying to respond in a way that we might feel is ideal when we're feeling a lot of really intense emotions is not an easy practice. And it's something that we have to return to again and again and again. Oh, good point. When we get back from the break, we're going to talk about the cycle of anxious uncertainty. Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Are stress and anxiety interfering with your happiness and preventing you from living your best life? There have been a few times in my life where I've needed some extra support and wish I'd had an option for online counseling. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. 
To be clear, BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help and their service is available for clients worldwide. You get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to leave the comfort of your own home. It's more affordable than traditional in-person counseling and financial aid is available. Special offer for Anxiety Slayer listeners, get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. Before the break, Jill, we were talking about mindfulness, and I thought that that would segue beautifully into teaching a little bit about the cycle of anxious uncertainty. Love, love, love for you to share more about that. Yeah, so I think what you're talking about is similar to what we were, the, the example of WebMD, I think, illustrates what you're talking about beautifully, which is, you know, when we face some type of uncertainty, just like with the, you know, the triumvirate we were talking about before, that when uncertainty arises because humans are evolutionarily designed to avoid uncertainty, you know, if you think again, back to early humans, um, if you see a vague figure off in the distance and you're not sure if it's a predator or a source of food, you had a survival advantage. If you avoided that ambiguity, you were more likely to stay safe. When we encounter uncertainty, it makes us feel anxious. And because, of course, no one likes to feel anxiety, it's uncomfortable, we tend to engage in behaviors in an effort to fix it, to solve it, to push it away in some, in some manner. And of course it works or we wouldn't do it. It makes us feel better in the short term. But that often then leads to more uncertainty, more anxiety, and on and on we go. So that's not to say that doing things to make your anxiety feel better, I'm not saying this is always a bad thing. We have to be really kind of context sensitive and think about what's the cost. So for example, let's say yoga, is something that makes me feel wonderful. It makes my body feel physically good. It makes me feel emotionally better. That's great, especially because it sounds like yoga might also be values driven if it's important to me to move my body and take care of myself. Now, if I am so unwilling to feel anxiety that I am going to yoga every morning from six to eight and every night from six to eight, and I'm not spending any time with my children and my children happen to be important to me, now this effort to get rid of anxiety is really starting to come at a cost. And so the, you know, the cycle is there for everyone to kind of think about in what ways is this playing out for you? And what are the things you're doing that make you feel better, but don't come at a cost? And what are the things you're doing that are keeping you kind of stuck in this loop? And so the WebMD, of course, is, is one example of those more loopy types of avoidance strategies. We often recommend breathing exercises and essential oils and nutrition and movement and sometimes just getting outside and taking a breath of fresh air. All of those things count. And all of those things can help you feel better. But in the honoring of yourself to get to the bottom of also what's going on and where are these feelings coming from? I think to the extent that those things allow people to be better, to be more present and to better show up to the things that matter in their life, then those are beneficial. That's really the question to ask when I'm engaging in strategies to try to feel better. Is this allowing me to participate more in my life and in the things that matter to me? Or am I spending so much time and energy and effort working so hard to shove this anxiety down? Down that like this is what my life has become about to the exclusion of other things. Mm -hmm. And there's this paradoxical thing that happens. I'll give you a metaphor. If I were to hook you up to an anxiety detector machine, it's just like a lie detector, but it tells me how anxious you are. And I say, whatever you do, just don't get anxious and you'll be fine. But if my meter detects your anxiety right about here, then it's going to deliver a lethal shock and you're going to die. But just don't get anxious and everything will be totally fine. <laughs> What's going to happen? Right. You're dead, right? And if right. you think about why that is, it has everything to do with your relationship to your anxiety. Because what you're now telling yourself is, oh my God, anxiety is bad. It's dangerous. It's terrible. I can't have it. I have to get rid of it. Whatever I do, I have to get rid of it. So you're now anxious about the anxiety 
Yes. So it's this paradox where as long as you're unwilling to have it, it's there because you're anxious about the anxiety itself. And so, so part true. of what we need to do is learn how to allow some anxiety to be part of our life so that we're not anxious about the anxiety. And even strategies that kind of look, quote unquote, healthy on the surface can become sticking points if they're used in the service of, oh my God, anxiety is bad. I have to do my breathing. I have to go outside. I have to go exercise. I have to have my nighttime sleepy tea. I have to, and I'm saying this in this very anxious way, but sure. this is often how people use it. So again, it's not yeah. saying all of this is good or bad. It's about right. what is this in the service of, and is it helping you engage more in your life? Or is it really kind of taking you away? Is the pursuit of anxiety relief actually taking you away from living your life? I love that so much. What questions can we ask about ourselves and our anxiety to help each of us live with more confidence? That's a great question. No one's ever asked a question in quite that way before. Let me try to think about a, a way to sort of simplify this. If I had to put it in a couple steps, I would say first, notice. What am I feeling? Where is it in my body? That's kind of that like awareness piece that mindfulness allows. Then the quit. So you, you asked me the question, the form of question. So the first question would be, how am I feeling? What am I thinking? And where is that showing up? Where and how is that showing up? That's the awareness. And then it would be, what am I doing in response to those feelings? So am I turning down social invitations, even though connecting with other people is something that matters to me? So what am I doing? What is that getting me? Because it works or we wouldn't do it, even if we rationally know that it might not be helpful, like procrastination, it works or we wouldn't do it. And does that have a cost? When it comes to the cost, not just is it making me feel worse in the long term, but is it taking me away from my values, from the person I want to be and the life I want to live? And mm. is there something that I might be willing to do differently? And that's where the acceptance comes in is instead of trying to avoid these feelings, can I make space for some of them if that will allow me to live the life that I really want to live? Which leads right into the importance of self-compassion and self-care and really being mindful of our self-talk and being sweet with ourselves, opening to that inquiry, yes. looking, at, looking at all of it without judgment to the best of your ability so that you can see what works and what doesn't, so that you can see, oh, maybe if I just tweak this here, if I take care of this there, I'm feeling a little bit better. I'm doing what I want to do. Yeah, I got this. Yeah. I think that the benefits of self-compassion cannot be underestimated. We are so mean to ourselves. And that inner critic is really there to try to help us, to keep us on our toes, to protect us from failure or humiliation or ostracism. But research shows it's actually not helpful. It's not beneficial and that we do so much better in our lives when we have a more kind and gentle stance toward our internal pain. You know, like, of mm -hmm. course, this is hard. Of course, I feel this way. I got this. I'm here. Right. Ananga teases me all the time because I'll say, it's okay. Let's figure out X, Y, or Z. It's okay. <laughs> she says, it's okay. <laughs> and I didn't even realize it was something I did, of course, you know, until somebody reflects it back to you. But, yeah. but I realized that that's also how I talk to myself. Now, where are we going to go from here? How might we look at this? Uh, and that sweetness has, has made all the difference. Oh, I love that. Before we wrap today, I would love for you to share the Be Mighty acronym. I think it's so smart and it's a way for all of our listeners to really get a sense of what this book is all about. And it's just really brilliant. Absolutely. Well, um, anyone who has experience with mental health professionals knows that we love our acronyms. And so it felt <laughs> fitting to end the book with a big, long one. And the the words are be mighty. And so the B is for breathe. The E is explore present experience. The M is make space for feelings. The I is impartially observe thoughts. G is give self-compassion. 
H is highlight values. T is take action. And Y is yell from the rooftops. <laughs> That's just fantastic. <laughs> is there anything else that you would like to leave us with before we move on with our day? I would love to share a metaphor that I found really helpful for myself during these past 10, 11 months. Okay. Um, and I've gotten some feedback from other people so that so that listeners will have something they can hopefully walk away from that they can use in their daily life. And, and it's this, it's, you know, people say when life hands you lemons to make lemonade, but you can't make lemonade when you don't have any sugar. Hmm. And right now over these past 10 months, I think we've all been feeling a great dearth of sugar. And sometimes the best you can do is, you know, try not to squirt the juice in your eye. <laughs> but what I want to point out is that when we show up and we're present for the tiniest of moments, those are the grains of sugar. So when you and I, Shan, finish this interview, I'm going to open my bedroom door and my little boy, he's six, he's going to go, <gasps> mommy. Mm. And he might be fighting with his sister 13 seconds after that. But for that moment, I am going to show up 100%. Pure and sugar. Those are the moments of sugar. It's pure sugar. And, you know, we're stuck at home and we're not doing a lot of the things that maybe typically add sugar to our lives. And so I just want to encourage people to show up for those small, sweet moments. Mm, thank you so much. That's yeah. just so beautiful. I really appreciate you logging in and having a conversation with me today. I know that our Anxiety Slayer listeners are going to absolutely love this conversation. Oh, good. I'm so glad. And I so appreciate you having me. It's been such a delight to chat with you, Shan. That was Jill A. Stoddard, PhD. You can get a copy of her book, Be Mighty, wherever books are sold. If you love our podcast, please consider exploring our Patreon for loads of Anxiety Slayer extras for calming anxiety, including guided meditations, tapping sessions, popular episodes from our archives, and behind-the-scenes conversations. Learn more at patreon.com forward slash anxiety slayer.